Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Chapalang Film Podcast. I'm your host, Sepeng. We also have co-host and film director, Jonathan Chu. Our guest today is Vignesh Kobinathan. He's a programmer at the Asian Film Archive and was formerly a programmer at the Indie Cinema, The Projector. Welcome to the pod, Vignesh. Hey, thanks for having me. Maybe just to start off uh, today's episode, I uh, just want to ask you, uh, how do you first fall in love with films? How do you, how do you uh, come, to, come, to, come to this world? Um, I mean, if I really were to sort of start from like a, like a beginning sort of thing, um, mm-hmm. it would be that um, it would be like watching films with my family, you know, right. on TV, actually. I mean, because right. that's where I think a lot of us would get our films from, right? I mean, they're, they're sort of regular programmed television. Mm-hmm. Um, and, the, and the whole practice of uh, recording it onto VHS, right? And then yes. you... you you pause when the advertising comes on, yeah, so that yeah, you have yeah. a seamless uh, thing. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so that's really like the my earliest memories of like film consuming, right? Yeah, and then yeah. last time because of the VHS tapes, I knew it takes up space. So there's only like a certain number of tapes that you can actually have. Yeah. Um, and so there's this whole idea of like rewatching the same films and like, over and over again. So that was mm-hmm. another um, very like formative memory of mine. Right. Uh, and then there was a VHS rental shop quite near where I live. So I used to live near. Uh, I used to live at Sophia Road near the the old um, uh, cinema old school. Uh, yeah. yeah, the last time, uh, and then there was a VHS rental shop down the road at P Center, uh, former P Center, I should say, now that it's gone. Which my friend, my father's friend, used to run, uh, Uncle Shamsudin. Uh, and so when I was old enough to be to sort of go out of my house uh, by myself, I used to just go there by myself and just like get tapes, you know. And and the people who are running the shop, they they knew like all the films, obviously. So mm. and they kind of after a while knew what I what kind of stuff I, I liked. So uh, that's yeah. These are some of my and then I lived near the old cafe as well. So my yeah. very first cinema was actually the old cafe, and then a bit further down was the old Capitol when we used to be there. So these were like this was like the setting of yeah. of, of what formed my earliest like film yep, yep, yep. memories. Yeah, right, right. What what were some of the VHS tapes? Uh, in your collection <laughs> back then. Yeah, actually, um, I mean, actually, a lot of them were Tamil films because yeah. uh, that was a big thing for our family to watch together. Yeah. Um, so there was, you know, films, films starring like Bajini Khan and Kamal Hassan. These were, were films that I remember watching a lot. Um, and then, uh, actually, one film in particular that I remember watching like, until the tape, like, you know, cannot work anymore uh, is actually the old Jungle Book. Uh, the, oh, okay. I think it's from nine, yeah, the nineteen sixty seven yep, sort yep. of version. Yeah, uh, it, it's just I just became like obsessed with it, uh, and I would watch it endlessly. Um, right. So that was like I think it, to to date I, I revisited the films that film like quite recently, like maybe a few years ago, and I watch it actually like a couple of times a year. I try to like revisit it. It's hmm. still like it's still as good as I remember it to be. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sipeng, do you have any uh VHS memories? No, I, I don't think I've seen a film on VHS. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, no, I haven't. Yeah, we should try. I, I we think, should try it one day. I think, I think for me, maybe LCD is the oldest tech right. I've seen it the on. L- yeah, L- laser disc, like laser disc. Mm. Yeah, LD, LD. Yeah, LD. The, the, the huge one. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 laser yeah, disc, yeah. laser disc, yeah. laser disc. Yeah, yeah. I actually inherited a collection recently, and then I mm. I still haven't really got to to unpacking it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think yeah, I watched we, we, Mass Attack and <laughs> Titanic on Laserdisc. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We had a brief uh, Laserdisc period, and then and then it kind of died, right? Then everyone just started getting VCDs after that. Yeah. yeah I remember. Okay. So, uh, that was your childhood, uh, into mm. your youth and adolescence. Uh, how how did the film viewing for you change? Uh, um, evolve from from there. Yeah, I mean, movie going was something that took on a different meaning. Of course, when I started, you know, get, going to secondary school, I could go out on my own. I could go out with friends. So mm. you know, there's certain kind of films that we watch like on, you know, namely the sort of big blockbuster stuff. So I remember my first film that I went by with my friends, and I was allowed to go with my friends was actually Pearl Harbor. Mm. Uh, I think this was uh, what is this two thousand. 
one. One, two thousand one. Yeah. Two thousand one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I went to Plaza Sing, uh, GV to watch that. Um, mm. but of course, actually, what 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 was a big uh shift for me, like in terms of my film taste and 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 all that was actually piracy, right? I mean, yes. we were all pirating <laughs> films. Like, let's be honest, yeah. right? Yeah. And then it became this practice of like finding this like really cool film and then sharing it with people. Like, you burn it and then you pass it to people. Right. Or, or you just know this one friend who happened to have this like huge collection, right? Because yeah. maybe that one friend has like broadband, right? <laughs> Whereas yeah. all of us were on <laughs> like some dial-up, some dial-up nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so piracy was like this big thing that I think sh- like opened up a lot of our worlds, you know. And then suddenly the films that I remember, uh, the uh, the first few films I remember that really like for me it was like okay, the films can be like this, you know, like they can be so different in terms of of the way they move, the plot and and structure. It was actually firstly it was Fight Club, uh, nice. David Fincher's Fight Club, and and then uh, Tarantino's Pulp Fiction. Yep. So these nice. two. I remember when I first watched them, I like couldn't make sense of it, but then I couldn't stop yeah. thinking about it. So okay, right. again, it, it, it brought back my childhood obsessive thing, but I would just yeah. like watch these films on repeat until right. I was like, okay, wow, okay, I see what they're doing here, you know? Then I yeah. became, I went to yeah. this like, that's, that's, th- these two films that really got the ball, the ball rolling for me. Yeah. Right, right. I, I have to, I have to like really give credit to these two films, right? Because I think yeah. for, for a certain generation, our generation, right? This these two films are like the the door you have to go past yeah, right? yeah, in, yeah, order, yeah. in order for you to really get interested in 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 yeah. in, in, in other parts of of, of cinema. Totally. I, I don't know why it's just this generation's pop fiction, but uh, yeah, mm. for 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 a good twenty twenty years, twenty five yeah. years, I think. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Young yeah. people, re- yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah, and ex- and actually, when film. we when we were discovering pop fiction, it was already quite old, right? I mean, it was actually quite yeah. an old film. Mm, yeah. yeah, like more mm. you know, more than ten years or yep. fifteen years really at the time. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. it was already a classic by then. So yeah, um, yeah. so yeah, this these were the this was the next that's the next step la, after the right, childhood right, right. <laughs> yep. exposure of two films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and then uh, subsequently, you know, you got into film programming. Uh, yeah, maybe. Just uh, talk us through how, how do you got your start in, in yeah. that, or or what were uh, the things you were doing before then, uh, before you were uh, doing film in, programming. In, in fact, Vignesh, I don't know if my memory is serving me right. I remember mm. first meeting you, like for the very first time at Perspective Film Festival when you were part of the organizing committee. Ah, right. Is, right. is that correct? Is that correct? I feel like might, I remember you yeah, giving a speech. Be. Yeah, right. what do you remember? What, what, what was, film it was? Or? Well, I I I cannot remember, but if I'm okay. not wrong, w- were you in the same like year as ET? Like you guys did perspective yeah. together, yeah. was it correct? That's right, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Was that the first time you you dabbled in programming? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, um, perspectives was like that that kind of first um, uh, dip into these waters, as it were. Um, and actually, I did two editions of Perspectives. The second one is when I was the uh, programming head. Uh, the first one, I was actually in the editorial team. Uh, but so, so I, I, but I didn't get, I wasn't involved in the programming. Lah. But, but it's really that second time where I did it, where I was, uh, if this was what I was doing. So I got to set the vision and, you know, I got to like, uh, come up with a bunch of films, defend my choices. And not just that, right? Actually, what transpired from uh, perspectives was also getting to meet programmers, like working, like, cr- like professional programmers. So, namely, um, Once Year, uh, Warren mm. and Zubun, and, I, and people like Aisha, right? Uh, who were at the time doing this profession that I had no yeah. idea what was a thing. Yeah. Um, so, so, actually, the first person that really like, Actually, the first programmer I ever met, even before I became, uh, I went to Perspective, is actually Aisha. Because, yes. backtrack a bit, when I was in uh, u- university, I was in Wikimwi, uh, I was doing the film program at Wikimwi. So, actually, my, my first dream was to be a filmmaker. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so actually, I, I made some, like, student, like, great, you know, whatever pro- projects, like, short film kind of stuff, and I submitted the first takes. Um, yeah. And, and then, uh, I one of my films was selected, right? I, I was like, this thing, and then, I, I, I had, 
like he was giving a Q&A and then Aisha, you know, was, I was like, wow, okay, you know. So, um, but, but, so, so Aisha was really the first person that I met who I thought, okay, this is like a job that, that people do. And then later when I was in Perspectives, I got to meet Wenxie. And um, because last time uh, uh, Perspectives was supported by NMS, uh, like they would, they would mm-hmm. support the, the the whole program, and they would, you know, they would uh, do like they would support technically and the venue and all that kind of thing. And uh, people like once here kind of became uh, some com- after some conversations with him, he sort of became like a mentor to me, someone who really um, not just taught me what the job was, but the sort of the ethos behind the job, like what it means, you know, like what is the the passion that drives what he does. And I realized that I really connected with that part. You know, uh, the 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 true the real passion to 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 find out more about cinema and to be able to share it. You know, uh, uh, and and that was the thing that got me got me going, uh, Yeah, really. Hmm. Do maybe for listeners who don't know Perspectives Film Festival, could you describe what it is and when you were programming for Perspective uh, during your tenure? Like, what was the the theme of the festival and what kind of films did you curate? Right. If you can sure. remember. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure I can a bit, yeah. Um, so Perspectives, for those who don't know, is, I believe, the longest-running student-run film festival in Singapore. Uh, I think it's now in its 15th edition, 20th, something like that. Some, Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's basically offered as a module in, within Wikimwe School of Communication, but it is open to the entire university. So anybody in the, in the university can apply, uh, and you get credits for it, basically. Uh, and you apply and you, you state your intention to be in, you know, different kinds of, of teams. Lah. So there's the programming team, the editorial team, marketing, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so, and then as a group, basically, uh, we decide what the, the, the year's theme is going to be. And then you, you, we all, uh, the programming team curates, I uh, think, anywhere from like six to eight films that take place over a weekend. So my year, uh, the, the, the thing that, that we, we went with, or at least what I proposed, when, which, which eventually got selected, was this broad idea of independent cinema or like films that were being made, you know, outside of mainstream, uh, in, like film industries, and we want to look at that through various lenses uh, at various places in the world. So I think uh, off the top of my head, I can remember we screened uh, Boys on Feng Kui, Bo Xiao Xian's mm. Boys on Feng Kui. Uh, we screened um, Black Silk, which is this Thai film from the 60s uh, by, by, by Ratana Pestonji, who is you know, commonly known as like the father of independent cinema in, in Thailand. Uh, he's like someone who kind of started his own film company and he would produce and direct and, and shoot his own films. So um, what else? We also did like a panel uh, with, with three filmmakers from Akanga film. So uh, K. Rajagopal, Fran Borgia, uh, and Yo Siu And then we sort of screened their three short films and we did like a discussion with them. And uh, we also got Fran to do like a producer's, uh, like a producer's workshop of sorts. So, you know, it was all mm. sort of thematically all quite linked. So this idea of like, I mean, because independ- working independently is the mode of filmmaking here generally, right, in Singapore. Yep. So I wanted to, 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 to bring that in and connect that with the various different histories and, and industries around the world. So, yeah, that's, uh, that, was, that was my years. Yeah, I, I, that was the first time I attended Perspectives. And I remember right. very clearly watching... Boys from Feng Kui in 35mm print. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that is yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you, you were the one who gave a speech <laughs> before yeah. the screening. Could be, it could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 J- j- just a short di- digression. Uh, Vignesh, do you prefer mm. watching a f- the origin uh, films, right? Nowadays, mm. there's a lot of resto- uh, 4K restoration. Do you prefer yeah. it to watch the it in its original 35 print or you watch it in this restore digital thing well i mean regardless of what i want it's about what's what's the options <laughs> right, are, right? Right, right i mean yep, yep, yep. yeah we don't we don't have the option these days but but yep. um i got the chance to watch a lot of films in on 35 when i was uh, studying in the uk and also yes. last year i, I went yeah. up to uh i went to bologna to attend yeah. the cinema retrovato festival 
which famously, you know, always tries to to show films on print whenever possible. Mm. And it's really quite uh I, I, I really missed it. Like. I really got yeah, like yeah. I, I really had this sort of chills, you know, like I, I just yeah. felt really moved. Um it's, that, that we were all like sitting it, in this right? room. Yeah, yeah, it's quite it's quite something else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh yeah, I mean if if I had a choice, obviously, you know, I would love to watch whatever I can on on mm. 35. But right. um yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and so af- after after we what what was mm. your first programming gig? Well, I mean, after Wikimi, my career digressed because um I actually joined NAC to do complete to do something completely different. Mm. I was uh, I was in the grants assessment department for Singapore Theatre, um, which I think I really needed a job. You know, at the time I was doing a bunch of different like freelance, like casual kind of stuff. Um, and actually, my very first programming job, I would say, uh, backtracking a bit before I joined NAC, was I used to work for this company called uh, this sc- this screen called Screening Room. Uh, it used to be an Ansiang. Oh, and it was, yeah, right. I don't know if you guys remember. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually like a yes, four-story building. Yes, I remember. Yeah, it's a four-story yes, building. Yes, like I first remember. Floor is a, yeah. First floor is a restaurant, and then the cinema was on the second floor, I think. And then uh, something like the third floor or something else, and then there was like a rooftop bar. Right. So basically, it was an F&B establishment. And it was started by uh, by 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 this lady called Samia, who 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 still runs uh, this um a very amazing restaurant called Coriander Leaf. Um, and so this was like her other project because she's a film lover and she wanted like a space where she could regularly screen films and then she could do like film and food pairings and that kind of stuff. And the I used to, I, 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 knew, I somehow knew about this place when I was in like year one of university. And I would email them every year uh, during during my summer break to ask them about a position that was never open. So I, I'll just be like, I'll do anything, right? Do, if you, I'll just do anything. I just want to be in this cinema and work for you guys. And then every year, this this business development person will reply me and go, like, thank you for your email, but you know, we don't have any like vacancies right now. And so I just it just became like this thing that I would do just for the heck of it. And on my <laughs> fourth year, my fourth year, I got a call, you know, someone from Screening Room called me and then they were like, like are you Vignesh? You know, like we actually have something that's like this is like this is wild. Wow. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Um. So 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 it turns out the marketing manager, uh, who's now my very good friend, uh, Jolene. Jolene was um was doing the programming on top of doing like the marketing, and it was driving her like crazy, right? Because she's like not a film person, and there's a lot of things to do. So yeah. she just thought like if we can cover a bit of budget, we can actually just hire this guy, lah, right? Who's been waiting in the, <laughs> waiting in vain. <laughs> for just four buy years. This. Yeah, <laughs> for four years. Yeah. So it was like a very low paying job. It's like hourly rate and, and I could I only needed to go in like a few times a week or something. I think I only got paid like eight hundred on up the upper limit like thousand. Lah. And I had to do like other random admin stuff. Right. But I got to do programming, lah, some form yeah. of programming at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember the first day I walked in, right? Uh, walked into the office and then the business ma- manager who's been emailing me uh, like rejection emails all these years <laughs> she like she like stood up and she gave me like a slow clap and then she was like <laughs> man she was like I, I gotta admire you man you're finally here and it's like oh my god you're multi you're the person who's been who's been rejecting me and then she was like yeah welcome you know like we've never had someone so persistent before and here you are this is the this job for you um so I, also do, I was doing that. Then actually, I was also working part time at NM uh, National Museum Cinema Tech. Uh, we've worked together with Warren and Zubun to put together the, the uh, shortcuts program. So I was an assistant programmer for one of the one of the sessions. Uh, I think the twenty fourteen, I think twenty fourteen or fifteen uh, year. And um, there was actually some talks about me joining NM full time, but there was some uh, there was some sort of headcount issues there, so that never never fell through. And it was coming to the one year mark of being being like fun employed and doing like random <laughs> stuff. So I was like, okay, I think if I if I continue any longer, I I I will be like I will be like wait, poor la, right? I mean, I just don't want to be poor. So so I applied, and then and, you know NAC got back, and I was like, okay, this is not film, but but I'm just gonna do it. La. So I just like, jumped straight into it, and I did it. And you know, it didn't turn out well. I mean, I had great colleagues, but. It's just the job was just not for me. It was very clear from the from the offset. Right, 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 right. 
and then projector happened la, right um so i yeah. uh, I, mean, I mean maybe i'm jumping ahead a bit but uh i guess yeah never okay this is how i i, I started at projector so uh projector started end of 2014 right i believe yes. yeah i remember the first sg re, the rebranded sg was there um yep. and then I, I i discovered this place and i would go like obsessively would go because uh, there's no other place like it mm-hmm. um and then I I kept going, and then one day um, Pui Yi messages me. Uh, Pui Yi from from of my objectives, as you all know, she messages me, and because she knows that I put like film programming is something I've always wanted to do. And then now I'm like this really like I'm really sad in this in this government job right now. Um, so she messaged me, and she went like, you know, there's like they're looking for a programmer, and I I I like recommended you lah. You know, I think you should just like message uh, Sharon, the manager at the time. So I did. And then one day after watching a movie, I had an impromptu interview. I just came out of the cinema and the chair was like, hey, you're Big Nash, right? You're, you're the one who wants to, to be a programmer here. And it's like, could we have a chat? And I'm like, um, okay, right? I, I, sure, yeah. So we sat down, had a chat. And then um, next thing you know, I was hired, you know. So I barely nice. 10 months into my NAC job, uh, I, I, jumped, I jumped ship. I mean, I just couldn't wait to, to, to go. Uh, mm. And I started at Projector uh, August uh, twenty fifteen. Yeah, mm. uh, that's how that's how Projector happened. Nice and yeah, I mean the Projector is such a wonderful place. Um, yeah, maybe share with us what is the process like of you know putting together the film roster, the film slate. Um, mm. I'm sure you know, un- unlike Asian Film Archive, for example, the the Projector is. A business right it has to yep. financially sustain itself and i'm sure that has a huge influence on the kind of films that you guys put up so talk us through like what kind of this discussion goes on behind the scenes when it comes to deciding which films to screen to the audience hmm. so projector was really like jumping to the deep end for me because up to that point i had not done anything resembling a full-time job as a programmer um and and this was a programming job in a cinema that had just opened relatively recently and in a way was still finding its legs both in terms of Mm. identity and then also in terms of uh literally making money right because you know it was it's a Mm. startup and and there's all those concerns about about breaking even you know the rental even even then wasn't wasn't um something to, to, to kid around. Um, so these were all real concerns. Combined with that was actually my, my, my beginning in programming was actually a lot, um, I had a lot more uh, freedom and a lot more, uh, uh, I had like, I had very lofty ideas of, 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 of cinema and culture and, and what needs to be screened and, and those kind of things. So in a way, those projectors was like a, was, um, was like a kind of a, um, a lot of like reality checks and a lot of things that I had I had to come to terms with, which I I, I carry very uh, dearly to to me to, till today. You know, the, just the the real brass tacks. You know, of how do you <laughs> run a cinema that also needs to make money? Mm. Uh, so actually, my first like six months to six to eight months was was actually a lot of agony. You know, I used to have like a lot of sleepless nights because I was I just couldn't figure out how to do this right. You know, like yeah, and then. Um, it was also projected at the time was a really lean team. Uh, and so I was programming, but I was also at the cinema selling tickets and I, I was also ushering people in and then sometimes people would be sick, right? So I also had to go up and run the project, the projection room and maybe wow. once in a while mop the floor, unclog oh, sinks, no. oh. clear, clear rubbish, right? you know, you know, so, so it was, it was, uh, my me I saying like I was out of my comfort zone was like really putting it very mildly. It was like doing a service job, front of front of house, uh, front lines, like kind of uh, staff kind of position. All this was completely new to me. I mean, and I'm I'm an introvert, so having to talk constantly to strangers and be enthusiastic, uh, and then also reserve energy for myself, creative energy for myself to think of new things. All that you know, it really took a lot uh, out mm. of me. But but really. Uh, it was, yeah, I learned a lot through that process. Yeah. 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 So share with us, like, what have you learned when it comes to balancing cultural aspirations with commercial demands? I think 
I think what I learned from Projector was that um, it you know it needed to 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 make the bottom line really at the mm-hmm. end of the day. So uh, at at the time you know the early days, a lot of the decisions had to had to move towards that. You know, mm-hmm. so so um, I I had to learn how to balance those demands. You know, um, and then also to be strategic about things. Of course, you can like do things that you like, mm. but what are the numbers behind it that you need to, you need to kind of work out? Uh, what are some of the, the the costs and things that you need to mitigate? Um, mm. You know, so so uh, when when we used to do certain things, it, there, there was this whole idea of like trying to eventize it, you know, mm. Um, mm. make it into an event, have a party after, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. And uh, design became a very big thing. So yeah, obviously that's the program, you know. But then I have to, I have to like work together with my marketing colleague and also with the designer to see like what's the best way we can we can make this film or this program like appealing. Yeah. Uh, so these were elements to the job which I still do to now, which yeah. I didn't I used to see them in very abstract terms, but now yeah. because of projector I could see them working together. You yeah. know. Uh, ultimately you know working at projector was was good, but I think it, it, it also taught me that working in a commercial space wasn't something that, that was for me. You know, I, I always wanted something that uh, was 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 sort of culture first, mm-hmm. um, and 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 uh, the institution like like a cultural institution like AFA, which which um, essentially doesn't need to worry about the bottom line because we're we're public funded or government funded, mm-hmm. uh, cushions a lot of that impact, and actually that yeah. gives me a lot more freedom to to uh, to execute or express yeah. the things I want to express. So it made me realize that this was what I wanted to move towards, and not true enough these things started to, to, to happen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Back, back then, Projector had um, two screens, right? So how, how did you go about, you know, filling those screens when it comes to like, which films to program at what time? Yeah. Like, what was yeah. your, your approach? Um, it, it really differs right, from, from film to film, right? So, so the, the main thing with, with Projector was all the new releases. So we used to go to all these uh, previews, uh, and and then you know to 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 like maybe it's that with Shaw or things like that. So we used to go there and then pick one of these films that you want. Um, and and then everything after that is is about how do you balance out these these different films, like, You know, do you put like if you if you have like a couple of heavy films in this in this one day, do you like throw in something that's a bit lighter? But you also you're also working with very limited uh things. So if you are only releasing like three four films this month. Then that's all you have to work with. You, know? yeah. you just have to yep. to turn things around and, and 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 yeah. So, um. But yeah, I mean, but just to backtrack a bit, I think I now have a more nuanced understanding of what culture is or how culture mm. is is developed. You know, mm. I it, it's not so um this or that for me. Uh, yep. And yep. I think yeah, I think what 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 I now understand about about say projectors' role in 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 our cinema culture is that their role has been and is immense. Like yeah. what they have done with to cinema culture in Singapore is like immeasurable. Yep. You know. Yep. And and they've yep. done that, they've done that through very um astute understanding of the market, yep. uh, of, of demand, of branding, and and where many have failed, right? Projector yep. has been the one that has succeeded, you know? And yep. I think that is like they need to. They need like some sort of cultural medallion, honestly. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. 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 Like, I, you know, I, and they've I, done and, and they've done this at scale, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so yeah, it's like it's influenced an entire generation of people up yeah. to now. So I I, I yeah. think cinema culture, right, you can even say that there is like there is a before projector and after projector. Yeah, yeah, uh, I would I would era. totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I feel very and, honored to have been to have been part of that process. Yeah. yeah. And you know, if you ask like the Gen Z generation, what is the projector? Uh, yeah. I would say like one in four. You know, yeah, is 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 very familiar to them, which is a, totally. which is a great thing. Uh, totally. Yeah. 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 Uh, just want to ask, were there any films you know that uh, probably didn't make commercial sense to show, but you all were just like, ah, oh, this is great. Let's just screen it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so so the person who was always doing that was me. So uh, when, the person who was always suggesting things that don't make money is me. Um, right. In many ways, still still the case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, actually, I can remember a few things that I I I 
kind of fought very passionately for and actually executed uh, was the limited releases for Singapore Minstrel, um, mm, CTS ooh, nice. uh, documentary. Uh, to me, still one of the best Singapore films like ever made. Um, yeah. but criminally under uh, criminally underseen. Uh, and then of course before it went to Netflix, uh, a Yellow Bird, right? K. Rajagopal's mm. Yellow Bird. Because uh, yeah. after mm. it premiered at SGIF, it, it didn't really have, uh, it couldn't find a uh, distribution uh, um, mm. in Singapore. So we, I, I did, I did a limited release of of Yellow Bird uh, in our screens, and so mm. we, it was like a once a week thing, and mm. uh, Raju Gopal would be actually he would be like present almost every week to do a Q and A, uh, and he would each week he also he invite like a different guest like what either one of his actors or you know or things like that, and so you know it, I think we ran it for, oh must have been um, at least like five or six times uh, after its SGF premiere. And it is something I'm like very, very proud and very happy about, you know, because uh, people really got to to engage with that film in 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 such an intimate way when we when mm. we screened them. Same with Singapore Minstrel, you know, the Q and A element. Also, every time we did a we did these these films, like I I we would get uh, CCA to come down, and and we did that, that Q and A. Um, then one of the last few things I did before I I ended my 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 tenure there was I did a focus on uh, thirteen little pictures. So oh, yeah, I remember uh, I going for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I selected um, I think like five five features from five different yeah. thirteen little pictures uh members, mm. and then I paired them with a short film that they had made, uh, and that that screened consecutively. So each week was a different short film and different feature, and then uh the filmmaker was also there to to uh to do the Q and A. So. You know, much like many of our local films, a lot of the films that people like in 30 LP have done, you know, just sort of screened at festivals and then never got seen after that. And and, to, and actually, the program uh, did very well, I would say. Um, mm. you know, I some of these some of these screenings hit even like hundred, you know, eighty to hundred, and and uh, I'm I'm and you know when I first suggested this, there was like quite a lot of resistance. I think they were sort of like, uh, <laughs> not sure. <laughs> nobody knows these guys, like, you know. <laughs> like, then I was like, no, no, no. You know, like we have to do this. You know, yeah. and then actually, my my impetus to do it at the time, right, was because. 13 LP was was uh, going through a bit of a transformation at the time. Uh, actually, for maybe for people who don't know, 13 Little Pictures is a uh, Singapore-based like, film collective, um, and they started uh, the whole ethos of of making films was doing it collectively. So they would uh, produce each other's films, sometimes act in each other's films, and truly make films in this like collective spirit, collective like indie spirit. Um, and really, I would say maybe kind of the first of its kind, maybe this sort of collective uh, um, filmmaking practice. And what I had noticed in that that 2016, 2017 period was that actually a lot of them were, were moving to bigger projects and they were already going, doing their next step. You know, they were doing like big, starting to do like big co-produced films, uh, mm -hmm. all these early, you know, like Land Imagine was, was in its pre-production stage, uh, mm. you know, uh, yeah, like, you know, BTM was also in his in his early stages of like Tim Brother Social Club. So all this was like brewing, right? So I really wanted to capture this moment of what they had done up to then so that people can have this context, right? Of where these where these filmmakers that you're now hearing a lot from, where did they come from? Like what were their beginnings, you know? So I wanted to capture that moment at the time. And right. you know, everything after 20, 2017, like it it was like their careers all like skyrocketed, right? Yep, I mean, yep, yep. you know, like like Chris went on to win a Golden Leopard, like Tim Brown Social yeah. Club became, you know, one of the highest grossing like in like indie local films. Like Daniel went on to make Demons, which mm. which went to like Berlin and and so many other festivals and critically acclaimed. So all this started happening and and um yeah, so so that was yeah, just to answer your question, this was this was some of the films, uh films right. or programs that were thought to not make much money and actually sometimes they didn't, but I did them anyway, and it was all about the response and the the way people engaged with the film. Even if it was like a small screening of like thirty people, everybody was just so engaged, and that was what um, gave me a lot of meaning. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, the, 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 the self... little pictures uh, is like the Wu Tang Clan of like Singapore <laughs> film, <right? laughs> and, then, and then after that, all of them have to do their solo projects, you know, like their <laughs> solo album. Oh man, yeah, that is uh, that's quite. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, more like the Spice Girls. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Quite well. laughs> yeah. What what are some films that you program that you expected to do really well? Like it it on paper it seemed obvious that it would do well, but it didn't. Like for example, I I read in an interview that you gave that yeah. you guys screened Son of Saul, which is yeah, right. this tremendously like awesome Hungarian film that won mm. the I think the Grand Prix, right? Um, yeah, but but apparently the turnout wasn't very good. Like, mm. why why do you think that was? And w- were there like similar films that went through a similar fate? Um, Son of Saul. Yeah, you know, I don't even remember the interview, but but I it was um, yeah, I think it was a bit of a surprise for us um, that 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 didn't like quite take off. But you know, I. I would say these things are just like so difficult to to <laughs> to predict. You know, you you think you think this thing is just a, like a surefire, and then it just doesn't quite like make it, and then you you just kind of scratch your head, like being why. Um, but I I think it, at the at the time it was, I, if I could hazard a guess, it would be that the films that because that was a film that Projector brought in, uh, like it distributed that film independently hmm. uh and that was that was actually a big risk because projector doesn't have the didn't have the marketing pool that it has now you know back hmm. then if projector bought a film and decided to market it themselves it's not going to it wasn't going to like reach the mass in the way that it does today so hmm. uh, that was one of the films that suffered from that la, i would yeah. say uh, I so 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 during those years, it became more strategic to like select films that say Shaw uh, was releasing because Shaw buys like so many films, and actually mm. a lot of their smaller titles, uh, they you know maybe run like a couple maybe one two weeks and then they leave the screens. So yeah. Projector uh, engaged in this strategy of like being the second run uh, kind of for these for these uh, titles, and that became like a very good uh, strategy. You know, so at some mm. at some point, Shaw actually started to release films exclusively through Projector <laughs> because it just made more sense for them. Oh, yeah. To, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's something that might I, if I'm not wrong, still might happen to today, right? Mm. So it's a win-win because Shaw takes the risk of buying the film, uh, and putting in that big uh chunk of money to to purchase it, and then Projector gets to release it and actually just take a small cut out of it. And if it does exceedingly, exceedingly well enough, then both sides win, you know. So, uh, yeah, to answer your question in a roundabout way, that Son of Saul is an, is, is an example of what were some things that didn't work at the time. But now, you know, I think if Projector yeah. were to strategically release or buy a certain film for, for distribution, I think, you know, there's a higher chance of them doing well. I think, yeah. Right. And from your observation, right, um, what kind of art house films generally sell the most tickets? Like, excluding like the very obvious like award winning ones. Do, did you observe mm. any like general pattern? Yeah, you know, these things are it's really like a crapshoot, uh, <laughs> really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um there was a time when there was a time when I would confidently say that, you know, any like film from Iran would do mm. very well. Because historically, Iranian films just seem to resonate very strongly with Singaporean audiences. Maybe it's the <laughs> political repression that we connect with. Um, but, <laughs> um, but so so you know, I I had like really banked on on some of these Iranian titles to to like do well uh, at at AFA, and actually they like uh-huh. kind of flopped really. Um, so, you know, these, these things change all the time. Like audiences change all the yeah. time and, and we have to like evolve with people's tastes, you know, it's a, it's an ongoing yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Sorry. Just, just to go back to that Iranian thing that you mentioned. Yeah. 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 You said the Iranian films that you program at AFA didn't do well. Some of the like... more recent ones are like, uh, I would say, uh, what's that film that, uh, Jafar Panahi's son did. Uh, oh, uh, on the road. On, uh, yes, yes, that one. Yeah, hit the road, yeah. hit the road. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, the road hit the is road, the, yeah. Jack Korea. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, hit the road. Hit the road. Hit the road. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so I, I remember I watched it at SGIF, and uh, I think it won, it won the silver screen, I think that year. 
Uh, yeah. And I, I remember being at the, in, the, in the audience uh, at Film Guard Mugis at the time. And it was like, the audience was like really engaged, you know? They were like laughing yep, at yep. everything. They were just totally yeah. into the film. And I was like, I wasn't personally crazy about it. But uh, I was like, okay, this is a film that, that I think people really connect with. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of a feel-good road movie uh, that also has a bit of like pathos to it. So I thought, you know, this is a sure win. And then we screened it and actually, you know, it just didn't do well. It I, Unfortunately, it just kind of, um, kind of flopped. Right. Yeah, so. is, is Critical Zone doing well? I hope, I hope it is. I, I love it. Not, not as good as I would expect, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's, it's not bad. better than Hit the Road. Yeah, but it may also be because <laughs> I've changed my strategy. So uh, last time we tried to do more screenings of the, of the new releases so people have more opportunity to watch them. But actually what it did was it spread the crowd out. So now mm. we are doing like smaller, smaller runs uh, so that it concentrates audiences into smaller like, number of screenings. So I think maybe that yeah. strategy has been, has been paying off a bit better. Nice, nice. Oh, but by the way, I also love, uh, I mean, I'm ju- jumping the gun a bit, but I love Stonewalling. I, ah, I yes, enjoyed yes, it. Yeah. Great film. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a great film. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, John, you, you want to bring us to NFTS? Right. So uh, <laughs> before we, before we tr- transit into to that point, uh, what made you decide to uh, take, take this next step, you know, to do the Master's yeah. in Film Studies programming and curation and kind mm. of lift your position at uh, the projector? Um, so a few things were sort of converging together. Uh, First of all, I never had the intention of doing my master's at all. It was not, I was like, I'm not going to go and study again. This is ridiculous. Like I've done <laughs> with studies, right? Same, um, same. Yeah, like, never would I go yeah, through yeah. that again. Yeah. yeah. Um, then, you know, so, so uh, at Projector, I mean, I think I was reaching a point of fatigue. I, it was really like genuinely it was fatigue. I was like completely uh, burnt out actually. Uh, and I didn't quite realize it, you know, until I was just, totally exhausted i mean exhausted on all fronts uh creatively depleted like energy wise i mean i just wasn't sure what i was doing anymore and actually what was frightening and quite quite sad for me was that i couldn't quite um, figure out my connection to cinema anymore like it wasn't it was feeling i was feeling this like existential sort of crisis like what is my connection to cinema um because i i now have only seen it through this one lens of like being a programmer at a commercial cinema and doing this job in this like particular way and scheduling. And then, you know, then the, the kind of films I end up watching are also very limited because these are the films that I will end up programming. So I don't have actually a lot of time to like watch films for myself. Um, so all this was happening and I just had this very strong feeling that I needed a change in this, in this very critical point in my life. And as I was thinking through that, I was like, okay, let me just like open up this box of like masters, like what's out there, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so I just like put this out. I just like kind of did like a bit of a research. I found a couple of causes in mostly within the UK and some in the US that were, you know, were film studies, but with a focus on programming and curation. Mm-hmm. Um, and the NFTS course was quite new. Uh, so I think when I was looking at it, they had only done two batches of the program. Right. Uh, and it read well to me because it was more a bit more practice based and right. it was less theoretical and a lot right. more room for research and that kind of stuff. So right. um, I just asked around. I, sp- I even spoke to some uh, people who were in the course at the time. I somehow got in touch with them and just like asked some questions. Right. And uh, I thought, okay, you know what? I don't lose anything by applying f- applying to this. Hmm. Um, and when I left Projector, I actually had a, uh, I actually joined AFA uh, temporarily as a, on a contract position because they were looking for someone to co-produce um, the State of Motion uh, program with, with Kiwi. Mm-hmm. So I was already doing that. So to me, it was like, okay, I don't have a lot to lose. I have this thing for me right now to have me covered. So I just, I just need to apply and then see what happens. Right. So right. I applied um, and I got in. Mm. With, so... Uh, and then I realized I don't have money. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is a bit of a problem. Yeah. Um, so I got into this course, which is like, okay, only 10 people go in. It's like quite prestigious or whatever, but like no money, like, right? I mean, I feel like no money to go. Uh, so, um, and I somehow, you know, I somehow managed to chance upon some 
you know, uh, good-hearted people uh, who who kind of just said like, "Hey, you know, just go for it. Uh, we will put you up with the with the money, like give you a bit of a loan or whatever." Um, mm. And that, that that got me going, you know. But actually, it was still a bit risk because the yeah. money that I got, uh, both through loans and 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 through like private sponsorship, was only for one year, so it's a two-year mm. course. Uh, <laughs> So I could apply for the IMDA scholarship, but the scholarship window only opens like half year, half of the year into my first year. Right. So it was like really like harebrained scheme. I don't know why I, I did it or thought that I could just survive, um, yeah. but I did. And then I applied to the IMDA scholarship also on a whim because they've never supported a programmer before. Uh, and then mm. I got it. So, so nice. I, was, I was like, I was sorted. Lah. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's, that's how that happened. Right. From from my understanding of the course overview, right, uh, students in the course will focus on, you know, at, at the initial initial part of the the, the course, they'll they'll learn about idea, form, and style in film, and then after that, they transit into more of the practice of cinema from idea to exhibition. Uh, could you talk us through briefly the the importance of this 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 whole curriculum for you? Uh, during your study day, um, I, I think when I when I entered, I uh, I was already one of the more um experienced people in the group. You know, yeah. uh, uh, both in terms of programming and also in terms of of like c- like cinema studies or, or or exposure to to film. Um, mm. but that wasn't an issue. I mean, I I got to learn a lot and actually I revisit some of these like film history, film theory, which, you know, we, I hadn't touched since, you know, since I was in like doing my bachelor's. So it was good to have that foundation like, revisited again. So the first, first couple of months were really more, uh, more lecture based, you know, so we have different people who are experts in different kinds of cinema who come in and talk to us about these things. And then later it became about, uh, like you, like you said, like, it's about like what, what the work of programming involves, uh, what, in what, what kind of forms does it take place? So we have people anywhere, anywhere from people who, uh, run film festivals to people who work with archives to people who do independent programming, online programming, people who run film clubs, people who work with, uh, experimental film. So, um, yeah, so so these kinds of of exposure. I mean, of course, it was a lot more Eurocentric and UK centric, but I got to experience uh, and hear from from people who who were, who were just like doing this work, and it was very nice mm-hmm. to, to hear to hear from them. Right. Who who are some of the tutors that uh you you were you were kind of studying under? Was it was it Sandra? Yeah, Sandra, Sandra Hebron, yeah. Sandra, yeah. Legend. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so Sandra yeah. Sandra was the she's the cause uh, hit. Uh, she's the head of the yep. course. Yep. So um she's the one that like you know selects all of us at the start and then um she she yeah. shapes the course. La. So Sandra uh used to run LFF, London Film Fest, um, and then uh, uh quit to become a psychotherapist. Um yeah. and then yeah. also an educator. Yeah. Uh Sandra's great. I mean, what's great about her is that you know she has this like real experience of working with an institution, but yeah. She also has. She's also. She also isn't afraid to like critique it, and yeah. get us to also think beyond, uh, uh beyond these things. Uh. And and she's yeah. very, because she's so well connected. She's able to also bring in people with such diverse backgrounds and experiences. Um. So Sandra was great. Another um tutor of ours who was, you know, quite regular was Jonathan Romney, the critic, the film critic Jonathan Romney. Mm. Yeah. So he would. Uh. He he of course was more um. He took more classes for us that were more based in writing and critical thinking. Uh, and he, he of course, also do some film history, film theory classes with us. Uh, his expertise is a lot more in French cinema. So it was also nice to, for, to, to, to see some like deep cuts of French cinema through him right. also. Right. Uh, yeah. And he's someone who, who, because he also, you know, re- he is a working like you know, film critic. So he, his knowledge of contemporary cinema and... Uh, classic cinema is like really rich right. so you know these are people that, that we got to learn from another person that I I, I really uh, learned a lot from is, is So Meyer uh, So Meyer is uh, they are a um, yeah they, they are a programmer they are a writer uh, and also an activist um, yeah. so 
you know, their perspective on cinema was also really rooted in these ideas of like, um, of like queer theory and feminism. And so the view uh, and, and problematized a lot of these assumptions about, about cinema uh, yeah. through their lens was also right. something that was very different uh, and eye-opening. For me. Yeah. So these yep. are some people that I can remember. Props to Sandra, you know, because like mm. she she hosts this thing called Screen Arts, right? That's she, right. That's she's right, in yeah. charge of it, which is like every Monday there will be a screening, yeah. And, yeah. and you realize that you, initially you go to this school, you would be thinking like, oh, this is a very uh, cine literate environment. People will be very <laughs> uh, loving with uh, 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 love to watch film and everything. Nobody goes to this screening. No, no, no. <laughs> no. They'll, they'll play like good, uh, Goodbye Dragon Inn, right? And yeah. be like three people in it. Uh, yeah, so it's it's quite realistic. <laughs> and then they'll play like First Man by Damien Chazelle and then Full House. Yeah. Right? yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. I mean, the, so, cool, the, the, the cool part of it was that we'll get all these like premieres, right? Like we'll get... Yeah. People, directors flying in, and they they would show the we we saw like I guess, I remember we saw like Black Panther before it hit yeah 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 the screens yeah, correct, correct, yeah correct. so yeah some yeah. and uh you just now you were mentioning about how uh you you got so exhausted to a point that uh you do not know what your connection to cinema uh uh was like at the time mm. when you were based in the UK uh in that two years. Uh, how was your connection to cinema then? Did it start mm. to uh, take a different shape, take a different form? Did you rediscover yeah. your love <laughs> for cinema? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it was like, it was like being, if I could draw like a, like a parallel, it would be like as though I was like completely parched, right? And, and then when I, when I got there, I was, I got to drink from this reservoir, you know, of cinema. Yeah, you know, and, and it was just like I was replenished, la, really. Mm-hmm. And 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 actually it wasn't it was it was more that I had just a lot of time to watch mm-hmm. films and actually right. read and be still and yep. not think about yep. cinema and then productivity, you know? Like yeah. that that wasn't yeah. the connection that was being made. My connection with cinema was suddenly it was back to what had had got it started for me. Me just watching films. And then yeah. learning from the films I'm watching, you know. Right. Uh, so I, I, as 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 John probably knows, London's like film scene, uh, film programming scene is like very yeah. exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's always um, something to watch at yeah, any given exactly. time. Yeah. And at at so many different levels, right? So you yeah. have the sort of institutional programming to the the sort of more indie like film club stuff to yeah. independent cinemas to the commercial cinema. So I got to really experience the whole spectrum of it and yeah. uh and just being able to to also i mean importantly also for me to read like because reading was something that i lost touch with even before i lost touch with cinema you know yeah. so not just reading about cinema but just reading about anything you know uh or anything that interested me and then the connection yeah. with reading literature and cinema and also all the other forms of art you know the galleries the the visual arts it's just being in that 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 rich cultural scene without the need to um be a productive uh like human being i mean of course i had to do i had to do projects and, and essays and stuff like that but not at the same intensity as as what work would be hmm. so um i think me being in the uk was was fundamental to to whoever i am now you know right so uh, yeah on yeah. on uh as part of the course program, you you have to do like a four week professional work experience, right? Right. Uh, and and during that time, uh, how was the experience like? Like, what were some interesting things you learned about, uh, the film business and the relationship, uh, with the audience, you know, mm. in in UK. So um, the film uh, the attachment that we we all we all have to do it's it, it's in partnership with the BFI. So my course is actually a partnered program with the BFI. Um, so all of us um, get to pick. The, so there's like certain available slots within various teams in BFI. And then we get to bid for it, of which ones we want. Um, and there's one slot that was in the, available in the BFI film archive. And that's what I really wanted. Uh, it was just me and one other person who was like vying for that, for that role. And then I got it. 
so that was like a great experience. So uh, the BFI Film Archive is outside of London, I think about two hours away in this small town called Berkhamsted. Uh And uh, it's like a it's like a real slog to get to. Man. It's like you got to like take this train and then like, you have to walk like half an hour. There's no, there's this, I think the bus only like, leaves like once a day or twice a day or something like that so if you miss it then you have to walk up this you have to walk up this hill and it's like half an hour and it's like middle of winter and there's like you know the uk there's like the sometimes there are some of these small towns there's no pedestrian path you're like you're walking on the road basically so anyway um so i did this one month placement with the this team in bfi that they, they are called they are called the curatorial archivists so they are actually uh a very old team in the BFR archive. They used to be called the keepers of the archive. Like, really wow. cool. Yeah, yeah. So, huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you think of them, they are actually like, I didn't even know they were they existed, but they are the frontline staff of the archive. So, they are actively uh, looking for collections. The people actually approach BFI, like, there's a hotline, right? You call and you go like, so my father just died and he like left a whole bunch of like, eight millimeter films do you want to come take a look you know that sort of stuff so they're like right. they are dead people you know yeah, so yeah. they basically curate what comes into the archive yeah um so i was attached to them for a month uh so i learned a lot uh, about that job and uh because the number one thing that any archive would tell you that they need constant work with right is actually cataloging <laughs> right mm. so mm. most archives are just facing an insurmountable amount of material that they have not even begun to catalog, you know. So <laughs> I was basically given a very full circle moment, a box, three boxes of VHS tapes. Yeah. So these VHS tapes, right, were from uh, between, uh, I believe between 2003 and 2004. And this was a time when BFI would still, uh, uh, London Film Festival was still accepting screeners on VHS. Yeah. So people were <laughs> submitting their short films to B to BFI on VHS. So these were the ones that didn't make it. Or some of them did or some of them right, didn't. It right, wasn't right. clear. Right. Uh, and I just had to like find out their name and I need, just need to like tag it and this kind of stuff. So I, I had to watch them, uh, the runtime. So I just need to put all like, it's basically just form filling, right? Hmm. But while I was watching it, I was like, actually there's something really cool about this because I would so while I was watching these films, I would go and Google what these films were. And sometimes you can't actually find any information about these <laughs> films. Like that's how obscure these uh, films were. Yeah. So I became very fascinated with this idea. Like what what are these like artifacts that we are like, that I'm just looking at that nobody knows about? Yeah. So um I I and I was like, obviously very bored of just doing like data entry la. So I went to my boss uh, and I said, uh, you know, I have this idea. I want to do a, a VHS like, film program. You know, uh, like I, I, it could just. I just wanted. I just want to do it for the BFI staff, like if they have some time, maybe like after work or something like that. You know, I, I just want to be able to, because I, I told him I, I have this like six or seven films that I, 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 I really, really like, and I think I just think they work really well in the program, although they are very different from each other. Hmm. Uh, and then he was like, "Yeah, sure, go for it." And then he, he managed to to book a, a like a screening room in the in the London BFI. Uh, wow. the BFI office, not not the BFI main BFI, but the BFI office yeah. actually has like screening rooms in the basement. Um, and this is where maybe when they restore films or when they need to test prints, they 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 watch it there. So uh, if he helped me book out a, a a screen there, and then actually a couple of these people from the BFI staff like came, and then people from my class came as well, and I did like a little <laughs> introduction. <laughs> And actually, my idea was actually to personally change the VHS tapes myself. Uh, mm. But some issue, la, like I couldn't, they couldn't bring the, the machine to the front or something like that. So uh, the, the, the projectionist ended up uh, doing a people probably did a better job. Than I did. But right, right. Um, that, that, was, that was like a really fun thing that came, came out of that. Uh, that, that do, you, do you call the filmmakers to come down as well? Or, no, or, actually, or some of these people are like impossible to find. Like, I don't know where they yeah. are. You know, like they there's like one film in there that I have no idea what the person person is doing right now. Uh, right. You know, but uh, yeah, I still think about those films too, too now. Yeah, but it's so crazy because they are like really in the box, right? And then yeah, you know, 
the the life is there, right? but nobody is. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Exactly, uncovered. exactly. And then suddenly you just made it alive again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So right, right. Just, just to wrap up this section on NFTs, like how did doing this masters shape your outlook on film programming? Like, did it influence the way you think about programming and creation in any way? I mean, it's very simply put, it just reminded me that I'm doing this because I love cinema, you know? Mm. I like, and it reminded me of that love for cinema and why that is the, the first thing that is, is, that's the thing that's essential for me. So I, I learned, I, I, what lodged in my, my mind after that was that if that connection uh, and that passion for, for cinema ever depletes, then I need to like stop la, what I'm doing. You know, because that's I, I'm not doing this because it's just a job. Yeah, um, that that was like yeah to me that if I were to put it simply, that that was that's what it's about. Yeah. Right, and and for you, like before and after, right? How? Hmm. What for you? What is the mission of a film programmer slash curator? After you you came out of NFTs. Hmm. Um, I think after I came out of NFTs, I had like quite, I'm quite different from then and then now, I think. I think after I came from mm. NFTs, actually, I had a very clear idea that I needed to go back to Singapore. That was my, mm. that was something that was very clear for me. Uh, mm. I, I think when I first started, I thought, okay, I could maybe like work here for, work in the UK for a few years, you know, like get some experience or whatever but i just mm. what i just felt so i was like brimming with so many ideas and this very deep desire to like shift culture or, or be take, mm. have a hand in it uh and then do that in singapore because i mm. when i'm in the uk i'm just one of many right but in singapore mm. i have something to speak to like there's there are things yeah. that i want to address you know there's things that there, there's there's things that i have a stake in the, the culture that I have a stake in, you know, when I'm in the UK, I'm just another foreigner, you know, uh, and, mm. and that, that's not something that, I, I mean, of course, I mean, it could be done, but I felt a lot more strongly for, for, for coming back to Singapore uh, and, and doing something here to contribute to cinema culture. Um, so, yeah, that was my, my uh, desire at the time. Yeah, I mean, it's still, it still is today, but, but I think I think I have, things have shifted a bit for me, yeah, a bit more. What, what yeah. were some of these ideas that you were bringing with, that you wanted to bring back to Singapore? I, you know, I really wanted to do a film club because I was very inspired by the film club scenes in, uh, mm. in the UK that actually have a very long history. You know, some of these film clubs date back to like the 50s, this sort of salon screening type culture where people would, you know, these sort of like, whatever, like, for lack of a better term, like these sort of intellectuals would, would, would gather and then they would like watch this program and, you know, there's like this like big discussion after that. So that sort of culture actually continued to, to, to exist in, in the UK, you know, up, in, up to now. The independent film clubs are like a really big thing there. And some of them are really niche. Like there's like this film club that would only screen like, horror films by women, you know. <laughs> like there's a film club that would only do silent films from mm. Hollywood. You know, um, so so I want I was I had a lot of desire to come back and do something like that, um, and because I what to also like go back another thing for me that programming is about was for me that connection with people, because the thing that I enjoy the most one of the things I enjoy the most about films or film programming is being able to not just like select a film and screen it, but to screen it to people and to be able to talk to them after. And if there's a QA and a to be able to have that real tangible connection with people, then you, you, because it's really about bringing people together, you know, films are really about bringing people together. And then we all, we all sit in the cinema and then we just like leave, right? But, but what if, what if we, we could engage with that, that connection that we have, you know? So, um, this is, this is the, the kind of things that I wanted to do. It was, it was, it was about, firstly, it was about the love for cinema, about creating community, um and to be able to do that and in different ways la. so i i had naively thought that i could hold on to a full-time job and also do like a, like some independent film club thing on the side uh you know it didn't it didn't pan out until like you know quite recently like i got to i got to actually do that so um yeah 
Yeah, if we have time, we'll, we'll get to that film club. It, it's called sure. it's called here 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 there. Is it? Or oh, I can't remember the this, name. This 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 where this where this, this where right? Yeah, very this different. way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. We'll, we'll we'll get to that if we have time. All right. Now now right. to Asian film archive. So maybe you yep. can start by sharing. Was the plan always to return to AFA, or it, it happened mm. only when you got back to Singapore? Um. So when I before I left for NFTS, I was already like I said, like I was already working with AFA, uh, and already doing some programming work uh, already. Uh, I had I had programmed quite a few things there. Uh, this was before before Odom had started. Uh, there were o the Odom's uh, o the plan for Odom were already in place before I was leaving. So there was already some talks about, you know, uh, you know, me joining full time and stuff, but I had already made my, my, my decision to go away. Uh, you know, I, I was quite certain about that. I wasn't going to jump into another job when I'm already feeling so depleted, like it wouldn't make sense. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't do that. Lah. Yeah. But it was a big, it was a big risk. You know, actually, if you think about it, I turned, I, I possibly turned down a full time job for something that has now left me, left me indebted and might not even last <laughs> for more than a year. So actually it's like a really crazy, like, like I said, like really like a harebrained kind of scheme. Anyway, yeah. but while I was away, I actually uh, continued to work with AFA. Uh, I did like projects for them. In fact, on my first uh, summer break, I came back to AFA to do a one month uh, stint, like a research based uh, job for them. So I think it was about just pouring through what was in their archive uh, and then sort of grouping these things into different thematic groups uh, and that sort of stuff. So I spent like a month watching like a lot of films uh, in the archive and then mm. uh, grouping them into these like large uh, chunks. Uh, so, so there's an idea of what, what kind of stuff could be programmed, uh, what mm. thematic links there are. So this is something mm. I did. I've done, I also did some selection work for, for AFA while I was away. Um, and then sometime in the middle of 2019, uh, yeah, sometime in the middle of 2019, uh, I remember I, I spoke to Karen. Karen actually visited uh, the UK on some on work. She was attending some sort of conference. Actually, she was presenting a Ring of Fury at a, at a Westminster, I think. Uh, mm. uh, yeah. And then she, she basically told me, you know, we are interested to, to, to have you on board uh, full time. Because now that we have the cinema, the programming team needs to expand. Uh, the work scope has expanded. Uh, and and I accepted, you know. Uh, actually, they they wanted to wanted me to join a lot earlier. Uh, I I pushed it a bit. Um, so I actually I graduate. I was supposed to graduate in Feb twenty twenty, right? Uh, hmm. but I actually finished all my requirements by October twenty nineteen. Uh, hmm. like a good you know three four months before everyone else did, so that I can have a holiday and then come back to Singapore by December to start my job. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> wow. And then just nice, right? Because COVID happened yeah, uh, yeah, a few yeah. months later. Yeah. So if I was in, in the UK, I would have been stuck and it would have been mm. quite horrible. So uh, it all turned out quite okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I read in an interview you did and you mentioned that the uh, Asian Film Archive is, isn't just an overgrowing library of well-preserved film, but an agent in the film industry prompting critical thinking through the medium of cinema. Uh, I, I think there's something that uh, personally I really resonated with that. Maybe you can speak to us a little about uh, this intention and the need to prompt critical thought and mm. perhaps the state of it now. Mm. And, and sorry, uh, and maybe just yeah. a little add on to John's question, which is maybe for the benefit of the listeners, could you just describe you know, what is AFA, you know, a bit of the history of AFA and, you know, the, the mandate and mission of AFA. Sure, sure. Um, so AFA is uh, primarily a film archive uh, that was started in um, 2015, uh, 2005, sorry, not 2015, 2005. Uh, and it was started at a time when essentially there was no uh, equivalent archive in Singapore that was looking into archiving uh, films. So we, we have the National Archive, but the, which archives films, but only as historical documents. Uh, and also mm. uh, TV, 
so they, they archive TV and they archive uh, historical films, so like newsreels, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. So uh, there wasn't a, a national archive that was doing that. Uh, and so uh, Tan Bitian, who was the founder of, uh, of, of AFA, his vision was to be that first, uh, you know, so it started as a non-profit, you know, fully run by volunteers. Um, you know, also doing like outreach work, so do even doing screenings and you know that, that sort of stuff. Even back then, um, and then over the years, it it, it has grown. You know, uh, I think there was a time when AFA, you know, didn't really have the funds to even continue running. So there was really like a crisis moment because you know it was really fundraising and 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 volunteer run. So it became a bit unsustainable after a while. Uh, this was when uh, the National Library Board uh, took interest in wanting to uh, bankroll uh, AFA to, to fund it because uh, they saw value in what we were doing and it, it aligns with uh, National Library's mission as well to, to, you know, to preserve and, and store, uh, share knowledge. And since they weren't doing that in film, AFA's mission really aligned. So that was the sort of, I would say, the second phase of, of AFA. And with that new injection of funds, the outreach efforts became uh, more uh, important uh, and it became more uh, essential to, to, to get the word out there. Because the work of the archive is, is, is uh, work, work, the work that archives do are, are very uh, behind closed doors, you know. It's, it's not work that, that is like you shout out loud, you know, it's not like, it's very sort of people just painstakingly working behind the scenes to to co to collect films and to archive them and to catalog them. But what what the outreach efforts do is to to create that connection with the public. So, um, so that 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 is where the screenings and the uh, the exhibitions and all these things started to to uh, gain more uh, momentum. Um, the phase three of of AFA I would say was when Odem Theatre opened. Uh, so this was a mm. newly refurbished cinema space within the uh, premises of the National Archives building. Uh, and that became a permanent home for AFA's film programs. So now this became uh, uh, like this, this space that we can screen films throughout the year and use that as a way to get people to engage with cinema and then through that understand the work and the mission that we, that we stand for. So uh, this is broadly the, the twenty, like somewhat twenty year history of 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 uh, AFA, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. So mm. actually, so so just to summarize, AFA actually has three large um, areas that that they, that we look at. So one is preservation. Uh, so this is when we we collect films, we 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 we, we store them. Uh, and of course, an, an arm of preservation is also restoration. So we select certain films to, to restore to, to, to digital. And then there's outreach. So outreach is, uh, in a way, more education and advocacy work. So this is where we work with schools, uh, many sorts of institutions to, to teach people about not just cinema, but also what is film preservation. Because the knowledge of that is kind of not something that uh, the general public knows about. So we try to do mm. that, uh, impart that knowledge to many, you know, even from a young age, like primary school, even secondary school, JC, and, and so on. Um, and then the, the other one is programming. So programming and outreach are like quite interlinked, but now programming has, has its own uh, uh, area to play, which is, which is primarily through uh, Odin Theatre. Yeah. So the... yeah, and you know, go going back to the question that John asked, which is, AFA being an agent in prompting, like in encouraging the general public to think more critically about things through cinema. Mm. Like how, obviously you, you do that through screenings. Maybe you can share a bit more about, you know, how, how you structure that, how, how you materialize that, that, that vision. Mm. Um. Yeah, so I think on a on a very on a very essential basis is how we um, we structure our programs, like you said. You know, uh, we want to be able to give people that that scope and that breadth of what cinema is, especially you know our mandate being Asia, like what is filmmaking mm. in Asia from 
which, whichever regions that they're from uh, and also to give people that sense of history, you know. Uh, so we we have, you know, the basically the two sort of mainstay programs that we have are the releases and the restored series. So the releases series gives you an idea of what are the contemporary works that are being made out there that are not quite, uh, and we, we try to be quite selective about it so that it's not films that have been distributed very widely or people might not like, know about, but, you know, sometimes also the, the award-winning stuff. And then we, we have the Restored uh, series, which um, lets you dip into the, the past. And watching these kind of films in the same space, in the same cinema, you, you're, you're, you, you see this through line and this connection, you know, uh, and the legacies as well. Um, and of course, with our individual programs, so when we do something as, as, as direct, as say a director retrospective, you know, you get to see the, the, the gamut of, of an entire body of work of a, of a filmmaker and you, you get to understand what, what this person's creative vision is. What are they trying to say? How are they expressing themselves through cinema? And a, an opportunity to see a retrospective is actually quite, uh, quite special because you know, we, a, lot of, a lot of people don't get to, to really witness these films in that, in that way. Um, and then you know, we, we try to do these special programs that are like thematic, thematic focus. So how can, this is when programming gets like quite exciting, like personally quite exciting for me. It's like, how can we put together some films that, that can evoke ideas that you wouldn't have normally had before? You know, this is what essentially what curation is, right? So you have an idea, okay, you want to talk about a certain theme or certain uh, idea. How can a group of disparate films come together to talk to this same, to, to talk to each other and then evoke this idea in you, you know, and then not just, not just one idea, but many forms of ideas uh, that fall under a broader, larger umbrella of, of, of yeah. So that's, that's, uh, these are the ways. And of course, individually, you know, we also do, like, we always encourage critical writing. So whenever possible, we uh, engage a, a writer, uh, to respond to our programs uh, in in a, as, as open a way as possible, you know, so from anyone from academics to uh, to creative writing, uh, people people who are more into creative writing. Uh, so and so connecting writing to cinema is one way of also uh, engaging with that criticality, uh, and where possible also to to give introductions, you know. So this is something that I really enjoy doing, to to go, you know, to say like okay what is the context in which we need to be watching this film and why, why is knowing that context uh, going to deepen our yeah. understanding of what we're watching, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I, I realize that it's a very important uh, part, actually, the, the introduction, mm -hmm. because it, uh, real, it, it really, it, it's also part of this, this almost like this ritual, so you know mm. that, that 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 respect that you give to to to, to this process. You know, you mm. go in, you you introduce, and and it's a well prepared introduction, just like how you know when you know you go to watch films in BFI. Wow, there's yeah. one right out. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's Without right. Yeah. Film, you know, day, day and night, <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, one yeah. right out prepared for you. That's right. That's that right. has like archival yeah. interviews that's pertaining yeah. to that. Yeah. Right. And and just to add to that, right, it's also, and the same thing I would say with uh, Q&As, right, with director Q&As or whatever Q&As after a film, and the same thing with introductions, it's also about letting people know uh, that I'm here, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is someone uh, who, who, whose work this is, you know, like, this is my work, yep. I am a programmer, yep. hello, yep. <laughs> you know, like, this yep. is something that yeah. people have worked on, la, you know, that, that human beings have worked on. Yeah, and this yeah, is a profession. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is my profession, you know, and this yeah. is an example of my work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, and yeah. I want to be able to, to stand and, 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 yeah. uh, and state that, you know, um, so yeah. that our work doesn't, yeah. doesn't get hidden, uh, uh, be, be, it, it doesn't get invisibilized. Correct, you know? correct, correct. Uh, because mm -hmm. I think for many, year, for many, many years, uh, work, the work of programmers was not known. You know, people like, don't know yeah. what programming is. They ask me like, yeah. "Oh, are you a computer programmer?" You know, I get asked that a lot <laughs> yeah. less now. I get asked that same, a lot same. less yeah. now. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, in fact, I, I, I spoke to like this young person who's studying like filmmaking in a cell and asked him what he wants to do, and he said he wants to be a film programmer. Then I was like, "Wow, 
okay, we've come like really far, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that makes me really happy, you know, because uh, I think work of any sort, especially in the arts, any sort of work that people do needs to be recognized for what it is. Yep. And yeah. me going up to do my introductions is is uh, my way of doing, of, to state that. Yeah. 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 So. And c- could you talk concretely about um, a program that you put together? I think, f- for example, there is the Coming of Rich series program that you yeah. guys did, which I which I really right. like, and also the Y two K Dreams. Mm. Uh, yeah, maybe you could pick pick one of these two programs. Sure, sure. I mean, they're, they're both youth related, and you know, share, talk to us about how you conceptualize the program and why why even uh, broach this topic. Mm. Um, I can talk more about Coming of Rich because I I spent a lot more time on that one. Um, mm. So, I think with most of the programs that that uh, I end up working on, they are they are the culmination of like a lot of disparate thoughts or ideas that I've always toyed with. So I'm always taking down ideas. Uh, I have this like long list of just random ideas because I watch a film, then I watch another film. Maybe like a few months later, a few years later, then I'm like, oh, okay, I can see like <laughs> I can see something's going on here, you know. Um, sometimes it's a very like it's a very uh, hopeful sort of thing where you have this idea and go like wow it'd be great yeah. if there's a film program about this but actually there's no film <laughs> yeah. that, but, that, but yeah. that, that also makes you realise that film curation is a is an artistic thing that, yeah. in, in terms yeah, of yeah. structure you know you are, you are create, it's, it's very much a, an artful thing yeah absolutely you know and, yeah. and you, 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 it's, it's quite um, surprising for me to actually realise that it took me a long time to actually understand that yeah, right. Right. It took me a mm-hmm. lot yeah. to understand that this is my this is a creative practice, and this is a mm. practice that I um yeah this is my creative practice lah, You know, because mm. uh, mm. I used to just yeah. think that, you know I'm not making anything, I'm not producing anything. So what am I actually doing? And then all these people who don't know what I'm doing, so it adds on to the to this like uh this sort of existential crisis of 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 not right, sure right. what my purpose is. <laughs> I now am beginning to understand that this is yeah. a form of creative practice, and and yes, yeah, that's what I do. yeah. So, um, so yeah, so so coming of rage was a combination of my thoughts or questions or dissatisfactions about uh, depictions of youth on screen. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So I've always had a lot of, I have always had some discomfort for this rosy. Mm. T- the, like rose tinted view of of uh, of youth, you know. Uh, it's and 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 a lot of times films about youth are just not made by youth themselves, right? So it's always some old person uh, who now mm. is like looking back and either looking at it with like a lot of uh, despair or a lot of uh, nostalgia, you know. Which to me, it's not very useful, right? Mm. Because it's really just uh, it's locked. It becomes locked into this sort of hermetically sealed sort of uh, framework and yep. I I have a lot of discomfort with that lah, because I've also seen films that that really talk about youth as a time of like, intensity you know and mm. uh, it, it, and I you know if you really think back you can really imagine how those feelings were for you when you were younger you know where you could think mm. you would change the world like everything was the best or everything was the worst you know and there's this like real um, yeah, just a, like an extremely intense energy, and then combined with that was my was my other uh, observation that youth cultures all over the world were uh, essential in political action and movements. Yep. Mm. You know, mm. uh, you know, youth movements that sprung out of universities that sort of intellectual height mixed with uh, youthful like anger and fervor have actually like toppled governments, they have shifted uh, culture, they have caused revolutions, uh, they have changed history forever in so many countries, you know. Um, mm. and, and that legacy, which we also have in Singapore, right, the student movements that happened in the 50s uh, and, and so on. And, you know, over, over time, you also get, okay, I also went to university here, there was no, there was no political energy in that yeah. in th- those times when i was there in, in university like it was completely uh, removed from student life and mm. 
when I think back retrospectively, I go like, okay, this, what, why, why did this happen? You know, and then you realize yep. that this is a purposeful thing. These, hmm. the hmm. idea that politics is to be removed from universities was hmm. a purposeful uh, result of, of of a series of actions that took place. You know, that that were because um, again, you know, of course, of our our culture of conformity. The fact that you know we our our single party state wants to retain its power and not have it challenged, so I mean things like I'm not sure if I don't know if you guys know, but how uh, apparently NUS was structured in such a way that it's difficult for you to gather in a in a spot, in a large spot like a like a large field. So NUS is like mm. quite insurmountable if you were to. I, I didn't know that, want, but I, yeah. Now now I realized. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because I teach that. <laughs> right, and it, yeah. and it feels like. <laughs> And I can't remember where I read this, but uh, you yeah. know. So basically, if you get from to get from one department to another, you're like quite tired, you know. By the time you get there, uh... yeah, no, no, no wonder, right? It's when you thing. teach, when you teach there, right? In a three-hour lesson, right? You have to yeah. let them off twenty-five minutes earlier <laughs> so that they can so get, get them points yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so this sort of depoliticization of the student body in Singapore, and then combined with the fact that you know there were these. It, even even now, you know, and, and in recent memory, there are political movements happening in our in our region that are they are being held and 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 um like the front the front line of it is being held by students, you know. So I, I was thinking about Myanmar. Uh, I was thinking about uh, in, in India when they were trying to uh, pass the Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, you know, in, in in Indonesia, you know, so all these were happening in our region. In the present and in the yeah. past, and I wanted to yeah. s- to talk about that. Like, I wanted to bring these films together to to give this sense that that um that youth is is more than just about this lackadaisical, romanticized, like leaning yeah. back and, and feeling nostalgia. Lie, lie, lie like, down on the grass. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Um. So there was there were, these were the the intentions that that uh that fed into coming of rich. Yeah. Right, right, and 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 you know, speaking of coming of rage, right? When when I was looking through the program on uh the 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 website, right, I realized that you all played a double bill of uh a short film on the main thirteen generation plus exchange student trust Willin, right? Yeah, I it blew my mind because I because I, I I didn't watch the film, but a short film on May thirteen generation, right? Back yeah. in 2014, right? I was right. in a friend's house, right? Right. And I will not mention who is it, who is it because yeah. I, right. I don't think, I, I, <laughs> sure. I, I think he doesn't want, but he was, he, he was doing a uh, post-production on the film. I see. So I was like, whoa. I, I was, I actually saw like some footage of it and then I was yeah. like, wow, that is really interesting. Also quite, uh, uh, seems like it, it could get into some, some controversial territory yeah. also. Yeah, and after yeah. ten years, uh, sometimes I will think back and like, what yeah. happened to this film? Uh? Right, and and now it really come full circle, uh, and and, yeah. and it, it got screened in this program. Yeah, actually, on that note, um, yeah, so actually, May Thirteen Generation. I mean, it, it was on YouTube, and you could watch it on YouTube. But yeah. I, I've always, you know, wanted to see. So when I thought of this program, that was one of the films that really immediately came to me because it's it's about yeah. you know it's one of those films about Singapore's youth movements. Yep. But Exchange Student Trust Lin, right, was like something that completely blew my mind. Like when right. I heard about it and then I actually ended up watching it, I was like flawed, you know. So I, I, it's basically about a, a, a Singapore student who went to Japan um, and he uh, was, was protesting the, the merger and the, you know, uh, of, of, um, of Singapore and Malaya. Uh, yeah, and... and Singapore, the Singapore government actually um, wrote to the Japanese consulate to ask him, ask for him to be re- repatriated back to Singapore so he can, he can be tried, you know, for, for, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, and then, and then the Japanese student body who at the time was being politicized actually stood up for him. They, they mm. protested for him on the grounds of the university. It's a beautiful mm. film. Like really, I've never wow. seen anything like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my um and it was like i think it's not really been seen widely either yeah so uh, it, i it, wish it more people saw like, it yeah it sounds like a documentary that 
only the Japanese can do. <laughs> you know, there's there's something the the, yeah. the 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 whole premise sounds like like like, like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So so to right. to to whittle down the the films to the thirteen films that make up the coming of rage. How how many films did you have to shortlist? And were, were there any films that 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 barely made it but got dropped in the end? Uh, hmm. I mean, okay. Like the, I think the the eventual number of the films was something like uh, I think twelve or thirteen. I think it's the thirteen. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Um, but in order to get there, of course, I have to watch like you know maybe more than twenty films, lah. Yeah. Um, mm. I have to say one film that I was very very keen on screening. Actually, two films are very very keen on keen on screening, but but I I uh didn't quite make it due to um, mostly budget related issues because like, they were very expensive mm-hmm. to screen uh, the one film was uh, was a Nagisa Oshima film a cruel story oh of... yeah right 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 uh, really amazing film uh, yeah I think it's called cruel story yeah I think so yeah yeah, yeah. yes yes cruel oh, story okay. 1960 yeah um mm. And then this other, this Korean film, uh, I think it's from the same. Hang, hang on, uh, you're, you're saying the Oshima film is more expensive than Battle Royale. Yes. <laughs> yes, surprisingly, yes. Wow, yeah, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We were quite lucky with Battle Royale, yeah. Uh, it was a new restoration and stuff. Um, I see. Uh, I can't. Okay, uh, the Korean film is called March of Fools. Um, it's mm. from nineteen seventy-five. Yeah, so it was shot during uh, their then dictatorship, uh, where mm. there was like curfews and and so on. So it's shot during the dictatorship, and it focuses on these university students who basically every like society is crumbling around them. So it's like this super like absurdist, like surreal kind of film about how nothing makes sense anymore. And order has been appended. Um, and then Cruel Story of Youth is, is uh, Oshima's take on the political awakening that the Japanese mm. students had in the 60s and also the failure mm. of that. Uh, that so it's, like, it's, it's really about the despair and the failure of, of youthful energy. And so it's, I, I thought it was just like a very um, sensitively done film that was also very hard-hitting. And so I really wanted that and Oshima is like an amazing filmmaker so like anything he does yeah. you know, uh, so th- these two films I was quite sayang la, that, we, that we couldn't because yeah. <laughs> I really wanted that perspective you know uh, so it's too bad uh, in 2022 right the Asian Film Archive held a retrospective on the work of Kinuyo uh, Tanaka Japanese yes. actress and director who appeared and made some tremendous films but was perhaps still quite unappreciated uh, underappreciated uh i mean compared to maybe more uh known known names in japanese cinema speak yeah. to us a little bit about the process about behind uh afa's journey to uncovering filmmakers that are lesser known uh underappreciated but have nonetheless made very important work like herself hmm. Uh, so Tanaka's films, um, they they had already uh, undergone restorations, like all six. So she made six, uh, directed six films throughout her career. They had already undergone restorations, and um, right. they were already making the rounds, lah. Uh, yep. They they, I I believe it was meant to screen at Locarno that year, and then COVID happened. Uh, yeah. And then the person that had curated the program at Locarno had stepped down. So eventually, I think the, the series were premiered at... Uh, I think it were premiered in Lincoln Centre, I think. I might be wrong. Mm. Uh, and, and so it started to do the rounds a bit. So actually, I had never heard of her film mm. uh, career, directorial career either. Although, of course, we all know her for her, like, her roles in, in, as, as actress uh, in like, mm. films of like Ozu and so on. Um, mm. So I it, it started with that curiosity to go like okay, let me just watch her her films and it feels like a good um it feels like a good time for us to do it because we have an ongoing mm. 
partnership with the Japanese Film Festival every year. We we put together a program that is yep. Japan focused. So that year, I thought, okay, it's like the news about Tanaka and all that is in the air. So it just feels like a good time. So I watched all right. the films and it's like, okay, obviously her six films are, are, are like a shoe in. Uh, and I just thought it would be um, also great to do a sidebar that of, of films that she acted in that uh, mm. were either like quite definitive roles for her yep. um, that also show the breadth of, because she has such a long career. She started from the 30s yep. mm. uh, when she was in her early 20s all the way, you know, till her, she acted all the way to her 80s. You know? Right. Um, so I think, yeah, you're, you're, you're right in the sense that filmmakers like her uh, are, are people, uh, I think AFA is very invested in, in showcasing the works of filmmakers like her. You know, of course, your greats, uh, you know, it's always going to happen, you know, your Wong yep, Kar yep. and Kira Stamets yeah. and so on. Yeah. But, but, but uh, actually, the works of people like Tanaka are the ones that complete the story of cinema, you know? Right. Uh, if, mm-hmm. if, if not for, for the work of, of, of people like her, um, we're actually yeah. looking at an incomplete uh, yeah. view of, of cinema history. Yeah? Yeah. To think that our cinema was shaped um, mostly by, by uh, middle-aged white men or middle-aged yep. men in general uh, yep. is like a deep, uh, fallacy, you know? sure. Um, that that the fact that 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 um underrepresented marginal communities, you know, women, queer people, they have been embedded within uh, the craft of cinema right from its very beginning is actually the truth, right. you know. And I right. think because of the work of institutions and and you know the work of like archivists and 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 people who are restoring films, we are now starting to get this more complex idea of of what film is. You know? Right. I, I've I've only watched one film that she done. Right. And it was in the BFI. I, I walk in without any preconception, right? And right. it's this film called The Eternal Breast, right? Ah oh, yes. Masterpiece. Oh my yeah. god. That film, yes. right? I was it's, totally yeah. destroyed. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like like in, in, inside at the end, right? Yeah. It's like Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's a masterpiece. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really like, like how, you, yeah. yeah, it's really like a master at work, you know? Yeah, so yeah. good. Such a good film. Yeah. Correct. And at the same time, you're like, this is probably not, when you ask people about the gateway films of like J- Japanese great cinemas, it, yeah, it will yeah. not get mentioned, you know? But it's exactly. so, so, so good. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, just a shout out to, to The Eternal Breast. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and yeah. I, I mean, for me, one of the other like joys about doing programs like this, right, is that I get to learn so much. So actually, I spent I spent a lot of time researching not just her films, but you know, I read books and uh, I, I read like history of her life and so on. So I become I become enriched at the end of the day uh, as much as 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 anyone who's who's watching the film. So I had right. a I had a great time uh, putting that program together and learning so much about her life and how she right. came to be who she is. Yeah. Can you, can you, before we wrap up this section and move to the mm. next one, can you just give us some spoiler on what you're currently working now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> spoiler. Um... Yeah, yeah. Some, some, some spoiler for our loyal uh, viewers. <laughs> I am working on a program currently uh, for April uh, that will be looking at uh, an aspect of Indian cinema. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would say hey. yeah, late 60s yeah. to maybe early 80s. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, Actually, it must be quite tough because in one calendar year, there's only that many months and there's so many possibilities that's right. You that's know, right. one can think of, you know, in terms yeah, of yeah. curation, right? Yeah. Uh, how, how, how do you all, like, you know, discuss and kind of make, like, mm. okay, this, this is where we are going? No. Well, a lot of it is um, opportunity meets with good timing, meets with resources, you know. So uh, we can have all the ideas we want. But if mm. the other things don't match up, then we're not going to get to do it. Yeah. Right, right, right. Sometimes you yeah. have conversations with some people, you know, maybe a few months earlier, and then you go like, okay, yeah. now I have a space to do this. And now yeah. there's, I have this uh, inroad to, to maybe these films that I want to, to screen. And then, yep, okay, yep, let's yep. match them together. You know? 
So it's yeah. it's a really quite an organic process, but at the yeah. same time, it's also like you said, like, quite determined uh, by these restrictions we have. And restrictions are always good. So I'm very yeah. thankful for these restrictions. You know. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, with that, yes. we've come to our quick fire round, which we will <laughs> usually uh, ask uh, our guests really very random questions. Yes. Yeah, either uh, choice questions or like uh, open ended questions. Right. Uh, so uh, we have a list of questions uh, prepared for you, really yeah. randomly. Uh, yeah. Some are related to uh, the, the 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 films that are programmed in EFA. Some are just uh. I don't know, some saving some some of the questions saving created. Right. <laughs> okay. So so the first question is uh they call they call her Cleopatra Wong or Ring of Furry? Cleopatra Wong. Okay. Oh, 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 why is that so? Um I think the story of Cleopatra Wong and the the whole the, the whole story of how that film got rediscovered. It's just quite quite spectacular. I mean, right, it's right. known to have been yeah. lost for so long, and then it was this like right. multi archive effort to like patch this film together, and then mm. also the idea that this was this international co production, you know, between Philippines and Singapore, and there was a whole, there was actually a, this universe that was being built around Kirby Wong. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. There's, there's, there's a series, there's a series of two films after that that actually are completely lost. Uh, that yeah, we are actually on the search for. So, right. uh, and it's like a really ridiculous and fun <laughs> film, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a real hoop to be watching it with an audience, honestly. I mean, so mm -hmm. is Ring of Fury, but uh, right. I just have a bit more of a soft spot for Clipper <laughs> Trouble. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Second question, uh, En Hui or Clara Law? Um, en Hui, yeah. Um, okay. I... I I think it's because I've watched more of En Hui's films, uh, right. and I've also watched films from her earlier period and also her current and later period and right. I her earlier films are I, I'm very fond of because they are like just very crazy like they just like, they make no <laughs> sense whatsoever uh, <laughs> and it's very really, it's very indicative of this like early era of like Hong Kong filmmakers right, right, right. who were just like very young right but they right. were just given so much creative control yeah. and what comes out of that is like completely wild and I yeah. I that energy is something that I find very inspiring, you know. Can, uh, can, yeah. can, can you share why is that crazy and free film? Because I have also another crazy and free film in my mind. <laughs> oh, what is that? I think it's what uh is either her first or second film. I right, remember the watching secret. it. And, uh, the secret. The, yes, the secret. Yes. The secret. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's the yeah. one I'm thinking about. Wow. Well, right, you know, right, right. If, if, till now I don't even I can't even remember most of the film. But I just right. remember it being like completely out of like out of whack. Uh. Like yeah, I, I, right. And it was just like super fun. And it right. was just going from one genre to another. It was yeah, comedy, yeah, yeah, yeah. then it yeah. was horror, yeah. and then it was thriller. Then I was like, wow, okay, this is brimming with ideas. You know? yeah. so. I, I, I recommend you to watch a film she made called The Zodiac Killers in ah, 1991. Okay, okay, okay. Set it's on in, my list. Yeah. Set, in, set in Tokyo. Okay. Nothing to do with the Zodiac Killers whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 supposed to be a uh or Chinese migrant story right, is that there. Right, but yeah. at the same time it's like oh we have to make money so you have all this the right. pitfalls of like genre traps like you know like yakuza right, right. and 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 all that right. and it's a huge tonal mess like, but uh, very entertaining nonetheless yeah uh, yeah yeah okay uh Seping, your turn hey, right what's your yeah 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 what's your favorite Singapore film. Uh, I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna say two. Um, so yeah, right. one is one is Royston's Fifteen, uh, and the other is uh, Roger Gopal's Yellow Bird. So okay. Yeah. Any any reason uh, behind your uh, your attachments to these films? Uh, I mean, Fifteen is a bona fide classic. I mean, up to that point, no one had <laughs> made anything close to that. I yeah. think so for someone to capture this zeitgeist of of, mm. of Singapore so astute, not not even astutely, but just to capture that energy, uh, it's just like a very special thing. Uh, the, yeah. the the language, the mannerisms, the ennui, the depression, and then to put it into this form, and then to also 
uh, explore this idea of queer love, you know, and violence and tenderness all in the same film. Uh, it's it's just uh, to me, it's really a masterpiece. Uh, Yellow Bird is uh, also for similar reasons. To me, it's also like a first for a lot of things. Um, not just is it a, a minority story, but it's a minority story that's told with so much compassion and and love uh, and such such. Um, yeah, just such sweetness and, and tenderness to it. Uh, even though it's mm. it's it's uh, about lives that are really hard, uh, about people living such difficult lives. Uh, mm. I think up to up to that point, uh, the, the 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 image of the of the Indian man has not been explored in, in such multifarious kind of ways in which Rajagopal yep. does. Yeah. And this is a combination yep. of like years of his of his short filmmaking, right? Right. Uh, which were already doing that. So I think Raja and his body of work belong mm. in, in this. Uh, this rich uh, history of Singapore cinema. Hmm. Okay. Uh, which filmmaker do you think seriously needs to make a comeback? I think I had to think about this for a while and I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> which filmmaker? Well, oh, it turns out that I did not uh, actually think about this question. <laughs> I, I, I thought about it so much that I forgot. Um, right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll come back to it. Let me give it a while. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, no, no yeah. problem, no problem. Yeah, no yeah, problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, political or music biopics? Uh, neither. <laughs> biopics are <laughs> one of my least favorite genres. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It is commonly okay. the worst uh, uh, genre of made of cinema. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. But what's, what's the okay. most interesting biopic you've seen? The most interesting biopic. Wow. Like, like I mean, for, for example, I think Steven Soderbergh's Che Guevara biopic of right, Che, right. I think is quite interesting. Yeah. That, that's, that's probably true. my favorite one. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I have one. Uh, I just can't seem to remember. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Next, next, next question. Next one. Um, uh, John, you want to go? Oh yeah, you go ahead, you go ahead. Okay, okay. Hayao Miyazaki or Satoshi Kon? <laughs> I haven't watched enough of uh, Satoshi Kon's films, so it would have to be Miyazaki for me. Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, right, your, fav- your favourite South Asian director? A favourite South Asian director? Um... It will... Wow, is that part of the question that you... Okay, I don't think it's here. <laughs> Did you add that in recently? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay um, it's fine. Um, I have recently... Because of this research that I'm doing now for this program, uh, I've been diving into this like certain e- area of, of uh, Indian cinema. And so my current favourite uh, South Asian filmmaker is uh, Govindan Aravindan. He's a mm-hmm. filmmaker from was active during the 70s and 80s. I think he even made up to the early... I think, yeah, 70s and 80s. Um, and yeah, he would... Um, he sort of like... He has this very sort of poetic style uh, and very experimental with form. Um, hmm. Removing and, and, and invigorating all at the same time. Yeah, so hmm. that's my favourite salvation. Right now. Okay. Uh, nice. We hope to see, see that at AFA. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who, in your opinion, is the most overrated Asian director? Okay, sorry. Before I answer that, I have, I have thought of my answers for the biopic question and the right, right, right. comeback question. Oh, right, right. Yeah, so yeah. The, bi- the biopic question, my favorite biopic has to be Center Stage. Stanley Kwan Center Stage. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Right. I think right. if you do a biopic, that's how you do it, you know? Yep. Yep, yeah, because yep. it addresses its own subjectivity. I think that is what mm. is 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 quite amazing for me, right? Because the mm. problem with biopics is that it pretends to be authoritative and objective. Yeah, and actually, yeah. that is what is precisely what's wrong with it, because it's not possible yeah. for any work of art to be objective about someone's life, right? So yep. anyway, yep. yeah. And then yep. um, the filmmaker needs to come back, and sadly, he probably won't. It's actually Ho Xiao Xian. Um, oh, uh, you, know, like, you know, yeah. yeah so, yep, but yep. it's like, yeah, I would love great to answer. Come back, great but, answer. But, yeah, you know, because I we have all been waiting right since assessing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. you know, sadly, that's that's not to be. And uh, I, but it's okay. He's done. He's given us so much. 
mm. and he has given more than 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 what we could ever deserve. I feel. I think someone like him, mm. I yeah, I I I I owe a lot of of my my cinema uh, love and the way I look at life and cinema. I owe a lot to him. Mm. He's a very extremely yeah. fundamental uh, filmmaker. For me. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, yes, I think your, I think this your, applies to. I mean, what, what you just said about hope, I think applies to all of us here. Yeah. Um, and and the, 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 the poetic circle of life thing is at Perspective Film Fest, you know, you guys screened Boys on Fun Kui, which yeah. I believe was my first wholesale same film on the big screen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Same yeah. Same. <laughs> all right. Now, who, in your opinion, is the most underrated Asian director? The most underrated. Oh, so you don't want me to answer, answer yeah. overrated first. It's underrated. Oh, overrated. oh, I, oh yeah, 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 overrated. Oh, yeah, yeah. First. overrated. Go, go with overrated first, yeah. Okay, this is going to be controversial, okay? But you oh, yeah. can let's go. Me. We Please love you. Wong. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> you said Wong Kawai, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wong Kar Wai fans. Hey, hey, no, no, this, problem, is just, no problem. this is just no what I feel. Yeah. 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 Uh, what, what, what are some things you you feel are overrated? Um, I, okay. Firstly, I feel my connection to his films really changed from the initial, my initial exposure to him. And then when I watch it now, um, it's just a lot of his, a lot of this, a lot of things he does just has, doesn't seem to have aged well. Uh, mm. <laughs> You know, I'm thinking specifically like Chunking Express, which I watched, mm. I revisited maybe two years ago, and I was very appalled by its depictions <laughs> of like Pakistani men at the start of the film. Where I was like, then they had playing all this like very this like this music that sounds South Asian. This this woman is just like like bossing them around. I was like, this is deeply offensive. Right. Um. And um, I think my other issue with him now I'm starting to understand is also his films are very beautiful, but sometimes I feel they're mm. too beautiful. You know, it's too, it's too beautiful that I, I feel de detracted or detached from the emotional core of the film. Uh, right. Not how I feel, but Happy, Happy Together, of course. Happy Together, mm. I still hold very highly. Uh, yep. But, you know, Chunking Express and Mo In the Mood for Love, I, the films like that, I, I feel a bit more distanced than I used to. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. nothing personal to anyone who still right. loves it. <laughs> All right, next one. The most underrated Asian director. Uh, the most underrated Asian director for me would be uh, Kazuo Hara, uh, Japanese. Oh character. my God. All right. Yeah from yes. the 70s uh when i saw his films on Mobi, like six seven years ago i i felt like i lost my breath like i felt like mm -hmm. i was gonna collapse like like right yeah his films are just so intense that i i feel like i yeah. had to take a break yeah right right yeah and never have i seen a documentary filmmaker who is so willing to put himself on the line uh, yeah. in the way that he does uh, and continued to do so in 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 that in that small body of work that he did, and he's still alive and still making films. By the way, like yeah, he's, he, yeah, he's still he, making like four hour. He now he's makes he makes like four hour, five hour documentaries. Right. Uh, you know, um, I have yeah. So I, and I think more people need to know about him, especially those films that he made. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Possibly I, the craziest documentary I've ever seen: the Empress Naked Army yes, Marches on. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But but um, extreme private eros, I think, is even crazier. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I gotta check that out. Yeah, yeah. That is the first one that I saw, and I was like, this guy is completely out of his mind. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. my my story with Kazuhara is, I I was at Tokyo International Film Festival. Yeah. At, so his his twenty nine his twenty nineteen film called Rera yeah. Uprising. Yeah. The screening was at twelve midnight, and it was full house. <laughs> wow! And it was a it was a four plus hour documentary, and Amazing. the aw the awesome thing is nobody left. Like at yeah. five a.m., we were all stumbling out of the cinema, like half dead, and we were just wow. like finding like where is the nearest bus stop so we can go back to the hotel. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. but it was like it was so 
like people were bringing their pillows and everything and just yeah, watching yeah, and yeah. oh my god that's great wow. yeah. yeah unforgettable experience yeah. yeah all right next one down down to the last two questions mm. favorite foreign film director by an art house master um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very specific. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, I took, this one took a while for me to to think right, through. Right. Um, uh, but it would have to be uh, Oshima's uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Ah, uh, mm, okay, yeah. It's uh, it's that, not maybe probably... strictly within that, but it was shot in like the Polynesian islands, and it was right. a co-production. Uh, and you know, so uh, I would say that yeah, it's one of my favorite films, and I think it's a great. It's a great like foreign cool. film. I think it's a bit of a cheat right. answer, lah, but I think it's a foreign yeah. film. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My 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 favorite foreign film by maybe not an art house master, but is Face Off by John Woo. Oh that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Great, great film. I need to rewatch great. it. Yeah. Very, very yeah, great yeah, film. Yeah. 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 I I, I right. think for yeah. me so, maybe for me yeah. the most recent one is probably Perfect Days. Mm. Okay, I haven't seen yeah. it. Yeah, I guess you catch it. By women, yeah. Right? Uh, yes, women does. Yeah. So, plot, yeah. plot anticipate a bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. All right, John. Uh, last okay. one. Favorite thing to eat around Oham Theater. <laughs> so, so that we can we can yeah. go next time. <laughs> Without a doubt, uh, Inlay Myanmar restaurant. Uh, in Peninsula. Yep. Basement. Okay. Yeah. Basement. Yeah. Great. The, the left great one. Food. Left one or the right one? Uh, if you I think it's the left one, right? Stair, if you go down the stairs, at the, if you're at the bottom of the stairs, then it's on the right. Yeah. That, the, oh, right okay, is, okay. the right is Inlay, and then the left is Mendeley. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. I went to, I went uh, to in, Mendeley before. Yeah. Inlay is the one that, that uh, I, I think is good. Yeah, so, okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Cool. So that's uh... <laughs> All right. So okay. Fantastic. With that, we've, we've come to the end of the, the podcast. Thank, thank you so much, Vignesh, for, for so joining much, us guys. for the yeah. last two hours. Thanks, really right. appreciate thank it. You, thank you, Vignesh. Yeah. And, 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 and we re- just want to thank you for all the great work you have been doing at the uh, EFA. Thank it's you. It's such an important yeah. uh, work during curating, during programming. Yeah. And yeah, once again, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Yeah.